It's a pleasure to be here with you and to, to try to bring something that might be of some help. Um, uh, Todd and Bill and I have talked about what might be useful, and I guess the theme that I've been assigned is the authentic pastor, uh, but we could think authentic leader. And actually, since pastors and leaders turn out to be persons, we could just talk about the authentic person. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. And I will have some things to say, of course, especially about leadership and pastoring. But basically, we're just talking about being an authentic person. I'd like to read a number of scriptures to you, and I won't dwell long on them, but I'd like for them to be there as a kind of background uh, for what we're going to be saying. And first of all, if you don't know Proverbs 4.23, let me encourage you to make it a companion. Uh, four, Proverbs 4.23. This says very simply, Watch over your heart with all diligence. Watch over your heart with all diligence because what your life is comes out of your heart. What your life is comes out of your heart. Now, your heart is basically your will. The heart is the center of your being as a person. And your being as a person is you are a creative, spiritual being. And that creativity is your will. See? Now that's how you, that's how you are in the image of God. Not, <coughs> not as a mind. And uh, many of us have this idea of God as sort of this great, unblinking, cosmic stare that just contemplates everything all the time. Give me a break, you know. Uh, that's not God. God is an active being, and, and actually, if he, does, if he wants not to pay attention to something, he can do that. And in fact, he does choose not to look at a lot of things. The scripture tells us that his eyes are too holy to look on iniquity. It says, he vieweth the evildoer from afar. That means gets way off <laughs> and looks at him. <laughs> okay. But with the righteous, he is intimate. You see? So, now, God is, uh, certainly he is a mind, but he is fundamentally creative will. And that's, that's who you are. You are a creative will, and uh, your creativity is founded in your body, uh, which is your little power pack that God has given you to build a life from and join him in his kingdom. And out of the, the center of all that is your heart. Keep your heart. What is it in, in you that determines your choices? Cultivate it. Watch it. Train it. And that's the secret. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching, for if you do this, you will, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And that same emphasis on the inner person. Jesus is teaching over and over, a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. So he says, make the tree good. Make the tree good. That's what we're talking about, you see. When we talk about the depths of the being, we're talking about the inside from which everything comes. And for the tree, that's the inner nature of the tree, isn't it? So, now then, when the tree has the inner nature of an orange tree, it doesn't have any problem producing oranges. <laughs> It's in great trouble if it has to produce apples. But producing oranges, no problem. Right. Why? Because the inside is an orange inside. And that's 
the key to understanding all of these issues about authenticity, the spiritual life, um, spiritual formation is another one of the words that has caught on recently in Protestant circles. It's a very old term uh, in the church generally. And what do we mean when we speak of spiritual formation? We mean the forming of the heart. The forming of the heart so that the deeds of Christ naturally come forth from that person. Let me give you one more verse and I hope you will, uh, I, I think most of us know this verse. It's kind of scary uh, because we really don't perhaps know quite how to translate it into action. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that they which run in a race, all of them run, but only one wins? So run that you may win. Run in such a way that you, may, that you may win. And every man that strives for mastery, as in wrestling or boxing or something like this, Paul was a very avid uh, observer of sport. And he uses the figures constantly. Everyone who strives for mastery is temperate in all things. That's almost straight out of Aristotle's teaching about ethics. The discipline of measuring action and emotion is moderate in all things, temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we for an incorruptible. I therefore run not as uncertain. In other words, I know what I'm doing. I'm very purposeful. I'm very conscious of my action, of my training of my care for myself. This is something that is right on the front burner for him constantly. I'm always aware of this. Not as one that beats the air. Back to boxing. He's using two figures, one here the runner and the other the boxer. And the boxer who beats the air doesn't knock the other guy out, does he? You have to beat something other than air to win. And uh, uh, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a discard. I keep my body under. The language there again is a kind of boxing metaphor. It's the idea of pummeling, buffeting the body. Uh, now, that, you know, that just brings out the visions of hair shirts, sleeping on spikes, <laughs> and all that sort of thing. But now what you know is that Paul didn't do a bit of that. He didn't do a bit of that. And, of course, this brings up one of the topics that has to be dealt with. And because we've seen, see, if there's something good and important, you can be sure the devil will try to ruin it. And he's very successful in this project because he works at the idea level. And he has gutted the idea of discipline effectively for basically the Protestant side of the church. Actually, it's, I don't need to talk about the other side here because they're not here, but it also is largely true on the Catholic side as well. Uh, the idea of discipline of training, of dealing with your body, of how you take care of your heart. You see, Satan knows that if he can rob us of that, uh, he has defeated God's purposes in our actual existence. He knows that. Uh, so, I mean, the New Testament, Paul, Jesus... Or they talk constantly about these kinds of things. But you see, he creates a kind of ideational block. And that ideational block causes us to look at something and say, meh. And that's all, that's all it takes is a shrug. Is a, 
Oh, I know about that. When you don't know about it, you know? So you have that in witnessing today in our country. You go to witness to them, they, they think they've already heard. Right? Because they saw a news report on a television evangelist. Right? So they know about Jesus. And so you can, you can, they, they shrug, they pluck it off. And that's the way ideas work. And we live at the mercy of our ideas. And the idea system is constantly where Satan works. When Satan got ready to go after Eve, he didn't hit her with a stick, did he? What did he hit her with? An idea. Hit her with an idea. And it's good, really, said. Boy, she was off. If he'd hit her with a stick, she'd hollered for God, wouldn't she? Satan comes around. See, he works at the heart level and the mind level. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Now, Paul, I think, was an absolute master of all of this, understood it perfectly. Uh, personally, I think Paul is the one who really got the message and was a, that Jesus was teaching. I don't understand why that's true. But when you look at Paul's behavior, you see a man who acted like Jesus. He acted like Jesus. And you, you know, if you, I'm, I'm going to refer to a lot of scripture I won't read here because I know you know it. But like you take the Corinthians and you read the personal testimony of Paul. What do you see? You see a guy that comes into town in a, in a helicopter that lands on top of the Bank of America building downtown and has a press conference and all that sort of... No, no. See a little guy dragging into town. He's not bringing in an entourage. He's not requiring support. Comes in town, gets a job, starts to work. And the other side of that is you see a man who has a word that is so mighty that he doesn't need anything else but just to speak that word. You see. And that's the balance when you see him pressed down, uh, he talks about being facing death all the time. And he did, didn't he? He developed a sense of humor. It's interesting, you come down to the last of his letters, Second Timothy, and see him really kind of joking about being let down in a basket outside the wall. You know? uh, he, he, he had a great, I think, sense of humor about life because he was so thoroughly positioned in his heart with the Lord. Now, this issue of authenticity, uh, we need to just address it a few minutes before we get into some of our problems. And what I want to do now is talk about uh, the mess we're in, if you wish, the problem we have with our lives, and being authentic, and being strong. And then I want to talk about uh, the disciplines, and the spirit, and the, what I call the golden triangle of spiritual growth into the mind of Christ. And uh, then the last hour, I want to talk about our whole life, looking at our whole life uh, in the plan of God for us. Um, I don't know... Uh, if it's okay, I would like to do it in more or less a seminar fashion. I know this is a rather large seminar. Uh, but I'd like to stop occasionally and see if you have comments or questions, if that's all right. Uh, and we will have a break in about an hour so you can refresh yourself a bit. Uh, so um, uh, let's just be as informal about it and uh, try to get some good content over. Okay, who is the authentic person? The authentic person is described by Jesus in John 10, 27. John, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, forgive me. Luke 10, 27. You know these words. He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Would you just take a moment and look at that and let's think about it. That's the insides of the authentic person. They love, you notice that that's all about the inside. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Strength refers to your body. You should love God with your body. If you don't love God with your body, you're in real trouble. And that's where most of us get into most of our trouble, is with, with our body. Not because our body is evil or anything of that sort, but because our body is where we live from. And fundamentally, we live from our feelings, and our feelings inhabit our bodies. Now, we'll be talking about that, so just think about it for the moment. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Those are four factors that determine where your actions come from. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, of course, you can immediately see things like, if that is all true, for one thing, you don't have anything to hide, do you? So you won't need to pretend about anything or mislead anyone. Also, you will not have anything, you will not be filled with fear, because love will have cast out fear. So you can see immediately there begins to be a transformation once you move to that level. Now you just you just love people as you do yourself. And of course, that's the second command because you can't do that unless the first one is in place. So now, here's the problem. The problem is that uh, Just think of this as your life, okay? It's moving in this direction. And I've drawn the solid lines here to represent the force that is really present throughout your personality, and particularly in your body. And it determines the actual course of your life, and of course, it's down. Apart from redemption, it's down. It's all down. Now then, your faith draws you up this way. Your faith draws you up that way. But the forces that are moving your life here are more than your faith alone, your profession, what you believe, can sustain. And so you are creating a divergence. Your life is diverging. That's what happens when the guy becomes a pastor. When the guy becomes a pastor, and when the gal becomes a pastor with him, the tremendous pressure begins to build on them. Why is that? It's because the upward pull here it is so much more important for this to work. And in addition, there are a lot of false expectations, both of the individual and those around them, uh, that make the pressure even stronger, and yet they continue to be human beings, and what is actually moving them from their heart, soul, mind, and strength, it continues to move them. And uh, I have a quotation here from David Siemens. An idealized, an ideal image, a fantasy, a false picture of the self develops in the attempt to get needs for approval fulfilled and thus to be pleasing, accepted, loved, and unique. That's, that's how the pressure builds. 
And so there's an image of what we ought to be, and then there's the reality of what we are. And if we cannot bring these two together, we are condemned to a life of hypocrisy, futility, inauthenticity, powerlessness, and we will spread the disease we're trying to cure. Now let me tell you that as a young minister, one of the verses, uh, it didn't quite, quite scare all the hell out of me, but it really, it really <laughs> bothered me, is the verse in Matthew where it says, you compass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when you get him, you make him twofold more the child of hell than you yourself are. Now, if that doesn't make your heart beat a little faster, you know, and the, that, that long discussion, because see, I, as my own background is Southern Baptist, and the one thing you do, even if you're dead as a Southern Baptist, is you win souls. Right? <laughs> so that idea of compassing land and sea, I mean, I, I saw that. <laughs> now what am I doing? And that accompanying in that same passage in Matthew where he says, uh, in Matthew, you you, um, you you won't go in and you won't let others go in. You bar the door to the kingdom of God. You won't go in and you won't let others go in. And uh, so the, the, the problem of overcoming this and, and becoming the person that we aspire to be as the people of Jesus. That is the problem that faces us. Uh, but it won't happen just by believing. Uh, the power against us is too great. Um, it's the weight of a life that has been built. And as Paul speaks of the emotions of sin that is in our members, that's not going to go away. And Paul's cry in Romans 7, the things I would, that I do not, and the things I would not, that I do. You see, that's, that's the reality. Why is that a reality? It's because of the substance that is over here on this downward area. And it's manifested in what you're ready to do without thinking about it. That's why Paul, that's, that's the situation Paul is in. See, he says, the things I would not let I do. They're done before you think about it. Uh, you see, if you're, if you, if, if, it, you're, these are what I call your epidermal responses. Because they're just right there. See, that, that's what, that you, when you see Peter denying Christ, those are epidermal responses. See, what he did, what he was ready to do which was save his skin. Actually, just save, he, he just, you know, it's, it's a social kind of thing. You just don't want to look stupid. You don't want to be on the wrong side. And, and here's this man who was saying, I'll die for you. Oh, and, and he did that. Now, Jesus, I believe, was teaching him all along about all of this. Uh, and that's why he told him what was going to happen and went through it with him very carefully. Uh, uh, but of course, Peter believed, like all of them, they believed in uh, the power of intention. And of course, he said, now you're all going to run. Said, no, I'm not going to run. Well, when the moment came, their legs took off and took the rest of them with it. <laughs> That's epidermal response. You, you watch what happens uh, constantly as you go through the day. And you see people behaving out of epidermal responses. And, and in our families and elsewhere, I remember when especially our son was small, I was just so stupid about so many things. But, you know, it was like if he spilled a glass of milk in a restaurant or something like that. Well, bang! Right? See, I was just right on him. Now, I shouldn't have done that, but that, what, was, what came out was what was in me. You understand? That's what I was ready to do. And I did it. 
And that is what Paul means when he speaks of the motions of sin that are in our members. It's what we're ready to do, what our jaws and our legs and our bodily parts will do without thinking. And then, of course, we have to think about it. <laughs> and, and, one, and the first step in getting on top of this is when it happens, you don't just let it run. You're able to identify it, and you begin to go back and ask yourself, why did that happen? What, sh what should I do? What should I be like so that that won't happen again? And you begin to work on the deeper levels of the self. See, a disciplined person is a person who can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Not three seconds or two hours later. A disciplined person is the one who can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. The French have a phrase, I think it's pensée la chair, thoughts of the steps. Those are the thoughts you think when you're going down the stairs, leaving the house, and you think of what you should have said when you were in the house. Ponce de show. Thoughts of the step. See, that's the undisciplined person. The undisciplined person is not able to do what needs to be done. When it needs. You're doing something else. Why? Because that's sitting there. Now, when you think of loving God with all your strength, would you please just think of loving God with all the readinesses which are in your body? That's loving God with all your strength. And the task is to get all of those uh, uh, things that divide us and bring them to Christ and let him direct us into ways of living that will change us throughout and especially at the level of our epidermal responses. That's the task. Thomas Merton says, the impure soul is devoured and divided by its own incessant efforts to assert its radical claims while keeping that, those claims disguised under an acceptable exterior. The life of a pure soul becomes exceedingly simple. The impure soul is and must be most complicated. I see if you look back at the two arrows, see what, what makes life complicated is the incongruity between these two. See, my, my body is running in one direction, and my profession is running in one. And my heart is wanting one another. You know, Jesus, uh, when he, when he uh, sees the guy sleeping, right? Uh, these were the heroes, you know. These were the ones that were going to be heroes. And, uh, and he, all, he just says, would you just sort of come and be with me while I pray? And while, just, just be with me. And they go to sleep. Now, when he says, you know, we have to understand that Jesus is teaching all the time, that what he says is deep all the time. Uh, he never scolds except people... Uh, uh, who think they're all right when they're all wrong and they're making a business of messing up other people's lives. He never scolds. So when he says to them, the flesh is, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, that's a diagnosis. That's not a general statement about flesh. That's a comment about their flesh. That's a diagnosis. It's not like saying, you know, if you had the brains God gave a goose, you'd stay awake. <laughs> He's not scolding them. He's saying something that's very important for them to understand. The flesh was not on the side of their spirit. Their spirit was right. That was what was expressed when they said, we will not deny you, we will die for you, we will not betray you. That was their spirit. That was their intention. That was their heart. 
But you see, they were still caught in this arrow here. And Jesus knew that. And you know, I don't make fun of good intentions. They say, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with, with good intentions. Man, you ought to see the one that's paved with bad intentions. <laughs> you ought to see that one. I'll take the one with good intentions any time. Good intention, and that's what Jesus said. The spirit is willing. You know, and praise God for that because that's the key. You start there and you can bring this flesh to the side of the spirit. Now, I think in our culture that's hard to hear because we there's a, a teaching, you know, that flesh is bad, but the biblical view of flesh is not that it is bad. Flesh is good. Flesh are the flesh consists basically of the natural powers of the human being. The embodied social person. That's flesh. Flesh is basically what you can do without the direct intervention of God. Right, so the all-time illustration of this is in Galatians. Abraham and Hagar. They managed to produce Ishmael without the direct intervention of God. Right. What about Sarah and Abraham? No, that required the direct intervention of God. So he's a child of the Spirit, also promise, you see. And flesh is not bad. Flesh is good. My heart and my what? Flesh. Cry out for what? God. The Spirit shall be poured out upon all what? Flesh. Flesh is good. It's God's creation. Now, what we want to do is to uh, evict all that bad stuff that has come to live in the flesh. We want to evict that. And God will help us with that because we don't have to do it on our own and we couldn't do it on our own if we wanted to. And gradually as we do that and we replace the natural or epidermal responses with the responses of Christ, the two arrows come together. Now, see, we, as ministers especially, we have to really be upfront and honest and serious about this. Um, quotation here from an article called Psychological Paths to the Pulpit. There is, however, a human element in the ministerial calling as well, a seldom acknowledged collection of ghosts that can occupy the pastor into both the study and the pulpit. These are the ghosts of childhood family roles, of parental expectations, of unresolved conflicts, of emotional yearnings crying to be satisfied. They are often the silent specters behind pastoral and pastoral wives and pastoral kids. Burnout. Chronic emotional pain and depression, or the sort of flagrant self destructive behavior that has toppled many pastors from their pulpits. You cannot deal with this by willpower. That makes hypocrites. That is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'll talk about that passage if I have time. But basically, you see, if we don't, what we're after here is not repression, but transformation. Transformation. And if we don't have the transformation, your willpower cannot handle this because the force of your whole life is back of this arrow. And it mainly comes in the form of your feelings and your feelings inhabit your body, and your body is where all those epidermal responses. I take road rage, you know. Uh, I mean, where does that start? How about road uh, touchiness? Road touchiness. So, I mean, that's where you deal with it. 
Okay, you deal with road rage, you've already got some guy with a gun in his hand or he's running over you with his Bigfoot tractor or something of that sort. Now, see, the understanding that you find in the New Testament of how the soul, the heart, the body, and all of that work teaches you, you begin with it before it becomes a fire. I learned a long time from my grandmother that it was easy to pull little bitty weeds. Just go on like that. You leave them there for a few weeks. It'll pull you. They'll pull you. And uh, Jesus' teachings are all directed at dealing with these things at the level where they are manageable. Where they're not just running wild. And with reference to things like anger and and lust and all those things, all of his teachings go to the point where we can actually effectively deal with. For example, anger. How do you deal with anger? Well, again, we've had a lot of teaching that you repress it. You can't do that. Anger will come out. It will come out in many, many ways. You don't want to repress it. You want to get rid of it. It's the same way with lust, covetousness, desire in all of its many forms. You have to learn not to repress it, but to change it. Now, of course, sometimes for a while you may need to repress it, and that's okay. Uh, cold showers have an effect, but you can't live your life in the shower. <laughs> And so whether it's whatever form of desire it is, what you have to do is transform that desire. Now, let me give you just one. Uh, I have a little transparency here, which I think can help us uh, with this same idea over here of the, area, of the arrows, but is a little more descriptive. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'll talk it at you, and we'll see. Um, this is a picture of you. You may not recognize yourself. <laughs> um, the innermost part is your heart, your will, your spirit. I think those are all best understood as the same thing in biblical terms. There really is no uh, coherently worked out biblical psychology, but if you follow the passages, I think you'll see. This is where you're like, this is what you want to give all diligence to keep. It's this very center part where decisions are made. Then you have the mind, and that's bigger than your will, of course. Um, your body, and that's bigger than your mind, than your emotions and your thoughts. And then the social realm, the social realm goes out beyond your body. So let's just think again of the case of Peter, when he was denying. That was a social setting, wasn't it? He was in a certain kind of place, a very threatening place. Uh, and uh, so, now, the soul is like the computer that runs the whole show. That's why I put it on the outside. Your soul goes far beyond your body. And depending on your culture, it may go more or less far. But the soul is the organizing principle of your whole life. And you are not a body. You are a non-physical being that inhabits a body. And you are localizable for now, in relationship to your body. Uh, but uh, you're much more than that. And so your culture falls out here. Your language falls out here. Um, the time you were born in, the place you were born in, and so on. And all of that is an important factor in determining what you do. So now when you look at this, the downward arrow here, that 
you've got an entire set of all these parts. Your soul, for example, what you think about. Let's just talk about that for a moment. What you think about. Now that's a very deep clue uh, to who we are, is what we think about. How we think about. And a major part of the restructuring here that must go on, and we'll talk more about this in the second hour, uh, has to do with the direction of the mind. 